Why give informed feedback to an author after reading their entire novel, when you can judge them harshly based on a single paragraph on page one? How dare they read a book in the first place? Scorn them. Scorn them without attempting to read their whole work. Naughty, naughty criminal bookmakers. Welcome to Nightmind. Listeners, as many of you know, being frequent users of devices that distance you from other humans so as not to be overcome with the pain of physical proximity, social interaction is a complex labyrinth of awkward exchanges and moments of crippling self-doubt. It is a dance with the proverbial two left feet in a ballroom that has been recently waxed, and while attempting to look cool performing modern dance, it weighs on the minds of all potential dancers that reaching out to steady oneself on a partner by, say, grabbing a shoulder, is a big, unforgivable faux pas, because of that whole embarrassing, physical proximity thing. One tool of navigation in the social communication realm is the comparison. You know, similes, metaphors, phrases like, Oh, hey, you remind me of somebody that I used to know. Like that one song from a few summers ago made by a guy that we used to know but now nobody remembers the name of. Comparisons are common. They're useful. But, like all components of social interaction, they can be exceedingly painful and incredibly annoying. <laughs> Sorry. If one were to, say, be constantly compared to a certain fictional community radio host, for instance, every single month since they first appeared online, that might get very irritating. It would be like receiving the same piece of junk mail in the mail barrel placed outside one's house each day. Assuming you're in compliance with newly updated city regulations and replaced your old, inefficient mailbox with the much sturdier, more voluminous mail barrel. It's like a flyer for a bookstore chain that sends you its monthly deals, even though you yourself are the owner of a quaint local bookstore and have as such never shopped outside your own inventory. So, no, you never signed up for mail from that bookstore chain, you've never even heard of them, you keep pretty much to yourself and your store. But because you both sell books, considerate peers decided, hey, let's send our friend the local independent bookstore owner flyers about books he can buy from the big chain store. He'll love that. He sells books. They sell books. It's perfect. And so, every month, Multiple flyers arrive for the same national bookstore, sent by those who have shopped at your own local bookstore. And while the sentiment of your customer base is... Nice, I guess? It begins to dawn on you that you will never escape how they mentally see you as so extremely similar to this other, bigger, older, more popular bookstore. You know, because you arrange your books kind of the same and your coffee shop corners both have black leather everything with a guy behind the counter who has the lip piercings just under the lower lip that looks like that one rock stars. So you have similar aesthetics and style, you know? So, have you heard of this other big bookstore? You might like them. They're pretty super. Here, have another flyer on top of the 10 other flyers your customers sent you about the same place. And that's the thing about comparisons. They build and build and stack up until one day, while attempting to carry your mail barrel inside, the weight on your back finally becomes too much, and your spine breaks halfway to the front door. Like a flimsy paper flyer, you fold in two, dropping to your knees, and there you break, finally succumbing to the weight that has been piling up on you. And I suppose that is what brings us together in the dark this evening. I have seen your flyers, you have filled my mail barrel full of the same kind of junk mail. 
You have come to my home and broken my spine. And in retaliation, I have decided to drag all of your well-meaning junk mail to the fire pit out back for a big, beautiful bonfire as a sacrifice to the vampire bat commune that lives in the oak trees just at the edge of the property. Welcome to Night Vale, covered by Night Mind. Like the bright, smooth scalp of Cecil Baldwin, I am now completely barren of any natural defense against the elements that attack me. I tore all my hair out getting to this point. You're welcome. Although I win in the end because, you know, a shapeshift to gross pack everything they want to, so ha, <laughs> I'll be fine. Also, my spine is really intact. Please do not contact emergency services. I do not need them. Maybe if I start stroking out in the middle of this whole thing, but we should be fine. Although, I must warn you all before we begin that there have been some technical difficulties today. You see, listeners, a very dark, ominous cloud has rolled over the area that's giving me quite a bit of concern. You may be wondering why exactly I can see a dark, ominous cloud in the middle of the night. Well, this cloud appears to have a sort of luminescence to it that clouds usually don't have. It's kind of green and purple, and then kind of like a weird tie-dye blend between the two all around the edges. So you see the glow, which lights it up against the night sky, and then you see how dark the cloud is. So, yeah, very dark and ominous. There have been these great, powerful rolls of thunder happening for about an hour now, and the air smells very much like rain. I've seen big, arcing flashes of white in the cloud, and the lights down here have started to flicker. If I suddenly go off the air, assume I have been struck by lightning. At that point, yes, do call emergency services for me please. I am not impervious to electrical shock. I would say it's a pretty fortunate occurrence that such an odd bit of weather has occurred for our discussion about Night Vale, the weirdest town to ever exist. They have their very own glow cloud, you know. It's a big, powerful, oppressive, brainwashing cloud that also happens to be president of the PTA. It might be an evil overlord, but it cares more about your children's education than those teachers do, I tell you what. Evil overlords in Night Vale happen to care a lot more about the way of life for everyday citizens than the citizens themselves, actually. They care very, very much, ranging from the secret police to the vague yet menacing government agencies and the mysterious hooded figures who are allowed to do pretty much whatever they want at any time. The city council, while also being a vague yet menacing entity the likes of which only H.P. Lovecraft could properly describe for you, doesn't really seem to care nearly as much as non-government parties do. But, hey, isn't that like every city? Ah? Uh, ah? Uh. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I know you're smiling, it's okay. Ah, but that's really the only smile that you and I can share during this discussion, listeners. I have done my research on Welcome to Night Vale. I have listened to the entire podcast, from backlog to present day. I have heard the voice of Joseph Fink speaking for entirely too long in his episode introduction so many times now that he may as well just write himself in as a character. Because hell, if you're going to hog up that much airtime, Joseph, at least do something with it that makes it entertaining for me to hear you speak. And actually, it's right around the time now in this video that one of his intros would end and the episode would actually start, so at least I know that my parody is on track. Yes, kids, after opening my channel and being bombarded with comparisons to Cecil Baldwin and messages about Night Vale, I have heard of Night Vale. I have listened to Night Vale. I am ready to talk about Night Vale. You want to compare me to your precious cinnamon roll Cecil Palmer so much? You are about to find out just how unlike your darling community radio host I am. The video is here. You wanted my opinion? You and the whole damn desert town are gonna get it. This is Night Mind on Night Vale.
You know, I don't think there's a better way to finish off Cabin Fever Dreams, a celebration of the really absurd internet creations, than with Welcome to Night Vale. We've seen a few items that have been pretty crazy, but made a point. They were art, and they illustrated their views very well, even if it was hard for the average person to interpret what was being said. But Night Vale... <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, Night Vale. Night Vale, Night Vale, Night Vale. Are you familiar with the idea of a character catchphrase? What's up, Doc? Did I do that? Bazinga! It's something that a character says once in a while as a joke, but often enough that it sticks in your memory. They won't say it in every episode of a TV show, but maybe once every three. It's a very old recurring joke, like a running gag. Plenty of shows have running gags. There is no creation in the history of things I've seen that has a worse understanding of how to use a running gag than Welcome to Night Vale. A running gag is a lot like an actual runner. It works if you let the runner stay on his feet and run around the track because he goes by, you see him, and you laugh. Then he goes away and a little while later, whoop, here he comes again. <laughs> what a funny guy. You forgot about him for a little bit because he was out of sight, but then he comes back and you remember him and you laugh and you love it. A runner is like a running joke. And just like our runner, the running joke also stops being funny when you decide you like him so much that you pile drive that man into the ground when he passes by, just so you can make sure that he stays exactly where you can see him so you can laugh and point at him and laugh and point at him and keep on doing that stupid cycle. But then the running joke tries to get up and go on his natural course, so you grab him by the back of the shirt, choke him a little bit, and then you slam his face into the dirt. Nope, you're staying right where everybody can see you, Mr. Funny Man. You're so funny. Everybody look how funny he is. Never mind that he just lost a tooth. He's, he's hilarious. Look at him. Except that you don't understand a running joke is meant to keep running. You introduce it, you let it disappear, and then it comes back and the cycle repeats. You don't beat the hell out of it and force it to stay in sight the entire time, because then we're just getting an earful of the same exact joke for 27 minutes twice a month. It stops being funny and just becomes sad when I start seeing all the different ways in which you can injure that poor man you have trapped on the ground gasping for air. This is the first massive problem I have with Night Vale, and it became my own personal running joke when I first began listening to the series. Dear unholy glow cloud above, this is the most repetitive, unfunny recurring joke style of writing I have ever suffered through. The town is weird, weird things happen, nobody really panics and we all have gallows humor about it. <laughs> oh, the town gets attacked, threatened, or destroyed by something evil and everything is fixed up during the weather segment. <laughs> Cecil reports on something quirky and weird. Oh, how funny. People don't understand how science or aspects of human society work. <laughs> and a character speaks in a light positive tone about something absolutely horrible. Oh boy, ain't that a funny one. And it's every single episode. Repeat that cycle again and again. Just keep doing the same exact thing while using different nouns and locations. Make sure it's quirky and throw in something supernatural. Bonus points if it's relatable in the same way that a meme that came from Tumblr tries to be. Play a game of Mad Libs, Night Vale Edition, and try to express that you don't expect to live past your 20s while you fill in the blanks without actually letting your friends know. Look up how to write in a formula, and you can make your very own Welcome to Night Vale episode. I live analyzing media that tells a story in a secret way or has deep artistic layers. I am very familiar with episodic storytelling. And sometimes, Night Vale does tell a story. It tells quite a few stories, actually. The issue is that almost all of these stories are plagued by formula. Whether it's a story contained inside one episode, or it's a tale that spans a few months being weighed down by the running joke getting beaten up on the side of the track, Night Vale suffers when it tries to tell a story, because it can't escape from its own self-indulgent wackiness. It is in love with that one single joke, guys. It's like peanut butter to them. They'll go and put peanut butter on every single thing they eat. Sometimes they put it on bread, and that works. Sometimes it's ice cream, and yeah, not many people do that straight up with peanut butter, but that also works. And then they'll go and put it on pizza, they'll put it on steak, they'll put it on macaroni and frigging cheese. Night Vale is weird. That's the running joke. That's the peanut butter. And there is peanut butter everywhere. If you are allergic to peanuts, you will die. It is the disease that cripples everything it tries to do. 
None of their jokes work on me because I've heard the joke so many times already with tiny variations that don't make it unique. It's the same knock-knock joke issue that Fatal Farm brought up about Garfield with lasagna cats. Knock-knock. Who's there? Night Vale. Night Vale who? Night Vale is weird. Oh no. That's always the punchline. Night Vale is weird. Night Vale is quirky. Sometimes it's weird in a scary way, sometimes in the quirky way. But whether it's dealing with an invasion of pitchfork-wielding worms actually killing innocent people, or a holiday where everybody walks around in soaking wet clothing, it's trying to take on the same humor, using the same approach, and it's all the time, non-stop. Listening to the series in marathon runs, I kept on telling myself it was going to be okay. Eventually, the art was going to reveal itself. It was going to become intelligent. There would be a real story. The writers began showing they were capable of writing stories, so they must have been working their way up to do something smart, right? But I sat there, listening to Cecil Palmer talk about the next crazy thing so nonchalantly, and report on how people didn't actually react, or they reacted in a quirky, irrational manner. And it never stopped. Nothing got better when it came to this formula approach. Over and over again, it was the same old repetitive bull. Fresh, new, and exciting series. Oh, I've been so excited to talk about this, I almost didn't make it through the week. Listeners, I really have discovered something amazing. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> I'm so excited I skipped over the intro. I mean, it's not like we have terribly many new listeners, but if any of you out there are hearing me for the first time, welcome. I'm David Dyern, and you're listening to Daybrain, the one-stop shop for hearing about all the most inspiring and wonderful new creations online. If it makes you smile, warms your heart, and gets you all ready to take on the day, I'll find it for you. Now, anyone who knows me, and again, I'm pretty sure most of you do, you lovely people, Know that I'm a sucker for a good, amusing anecdote that brings a sense of gentle familiarity even to the strangest things. It's like curling up with a good book you've read long before, or watching a beloved cartoon from your youth you haven't seen in years. Somewhere in that incredible noggin of yours, you've absorbed the feeling of those things, even if your memory of them is a little fuzzy on the exact details. It might be a bit weirder than you recall, but the warm, fuzzy feeling is still there, greeting you like an old friend. For example, let's say... Ah, there's this funny-looking cloud over the studio right now, and it's been acting mighty odd all day. I didn't hear anything in the forecast about a black cloud against a perfectly blue afternoon. One that seems to pull the light around it in and, uh, every so often, just let out a black bolt of lightning. But hey, who am I to judge, right? I think it's interesting, to say the least. Can't enjoy the sunshine without a little rain, am I right? But on to the subject at hand. Welcome to Night Vale. Good golly, where do I begin with how ingeniously clever the writing and planning of this series is? This has got that feeling in spades, friends. It's got this really cute premise to boot. A desert town full of regular people living their lives, only to be constantly menaced by forces they scarcely understand, yet blindly accept as normal factors of everyday life. And it's all told through the lens of the town's community radio station, specifically its quirky host, Cecil Gershwin Palmer. Usually, each episode follows a specific pattern. Cecil presents the major news story of the day, which updates throughout the program and builds over time. Cecil will present other items on the show between updates, traffic, words from the sponsor, minor news stories, anecdotes, and fun facts, you name it. Before the main news grows out of hand and it looks like some great disaster is about to befall the town, Cecil moves us to the weather, always a musical segment from an independent artist, before returning to the studio where the main news story was somehow resolved during the weather break. Cecil has some parting thoughts before he bids the town a charming good night. It sounds simple enough, right? Well, the beauty of Night Vale as a whole comes through its consistent dedication to its core theme. This is a town where the weird and unusual are so commonplace, they're just glossed over. And the writing and the way the jokes are presented is meant to evoke just that, a blasé window of a town stuck in its ways. Where some might find recurring gags repetitive, they instead evoke that familiarity with the town and culture, making you, the listener, feel like a citizen yourself. You know what to expect? You chuckle knowingly at the oddness, and you feel connected with the universe in Night Vale, 
Just another day in this little town. But where the show really shines is how it hides little details to those paying attention. With awareness of the tropes, you also become familiar with some of the seemingly one-off weird things that are mentioned. You get so in tune with the happenings of Night Vale, you might disregard a simple piece of information as some strange bit of nonsense done for a lark. But that's how it gets you. Suddenly, a small detail from a long time ago pops up, and it just tickles your fancy. They were building up to something meaningful the whole time. There was deliberate, careful thought put into what's happening behind the abstract weirdness. It leaves you guessing, wondering what banal or chuckle-worthy thing is going to factor into the ultimate fate of Night Vale and its citizens. A dark planet lit by no sun, a strange massed army and a blinking light up on the mountain, if mountains really do exist, a set of plastic lawn flamingos that may or may not have been planted by a vague yet menacing government agency, the rival town of Desert Bluffs with its belief in corporatocracy and a smiling god. I could go on, listeners, but I worry my smile might start hurting my face. Gotta be careful. It's not always laugh out loud funny, but I don't think it was meant to be. Night Vale is about building a sense of community, and with all the listeners knowing the tropes and the patterns, knowing what drives Night Vale, this would not help people feel more like a part of Night Vale's citizenry. It's comforting having that sense of oneness in a world with so many scary uncertainties and variables. Oh, but of course I couldn't talk about Night Vale proper without talking about the real meat of the story, and that's its myriad cast of colorful, delightful characters, just as oddball and wacky as the town they come from. I mean, where do I even start? There's Cecil, of course, and Carlos, and Mayor Cardinal, and John Peters, you know, the farmer, and the man in the tan jacket, and the woman, the woman... The woman from Italy. But besides the humor in Night Vale not working most of the time, characters are another aspect of the series that really makes it hard to get on board. In order to have people care about a story that you're telling, you need to provide them with characters that they can care about. The characters need to be more than just their jobs and a few adjectives. They need to make a human connection. You need to be able to empathize with them. Night Vale really doesn't give you characters you can attach yourself to. There's Cecil, who you're always with, and... Duh. Well, there's, <laughs> there's Cecil. That's who you have. You have Cecil. The only person you can truly build a relationship with is Cecil. Even with all of the other characters that do come on the air... It feels like the only one who shows any sort of true depth and roundness is Cecil. Carlos, his boyfriend, is a pretty celebrated character in the series, the most likely character to be mentioned after Cecil. But if you stop to think about Carlos and really examine him as a writer, you see quite a lot of empty space where genuine effort should have gone. Who is Carlos? Carlos is a scientist. Carlos has perfect hair, and is said to have teeth like a military cemetery, which is another way of saying that he also has perfect teeth. So, perfect teeth and perfect hair. Carlos is Cecil Palmer's boyfriend, and usually that's one of the only things that he's capable of talking about. When he's not talking about his love for Cecil, he's talking about his love for science in the roundabout, I don't actually understand this, literally nobody does or can kind of way that plagues Night Vale. Carlos is constantly described as a dreamy boyfriend, when he's not talking about science in that painfully quirky Night Vale manner, he is unable to stop mentioning how he is, of course, Cecil Palmer's boyfriend. Have I mentioned that Carlos is Cecil Palmer's boyfriend? I've told you that, right? Because they're together, you know. Carlos and Cecil, they're boyfriends together. They're together. They're a couple. Carlos and Cecil. Cecil and Carlos. How does it feel to keep being told that over and over and over and over and over again when you have an opportunity to actually learn things about a character who might be interesting? Doesn't feel that good, right? Kind of feels like you're getting dicked around. Kind of feels like a writer is avoiding his responsibility to you. Feels kind of like a song with only one note, right? Yeah. Anything Carlos has to say besides enjoying science and being Cecil's boyfriend is quirky commentary on whatever weird thing is happening in Night Vale and mundane small talk. That is, legitimately, all there is to Carlos as a character, and it brings into light such a major, major problem with Night Vale's character writing. 
The only reason that I believe so many listeners who love Night Vale skip around the issue of Carlos being a majorly underdeveloped character is because he's the lover of Cecil, who is of course their darling. And the treatment of the relationship and the sexualities of these two men is something that you never ever see in… well, pretty much anything ever. Night Vale is actually extremely unique when it comes to this. It's like the series is running a marathon of not stating the obvious that you expect is going to break at some point, but it never actually does. You see, the relationship between Carlos and Cecil is handled with such a major amount of respect and acceptance that even though it is quite obviously a gay relationship, you never even hear the terms gay, homosexual, or anything like that throughout the entire series. Cecil and Carlos aren't described as anything other than Cecil and Carlos who happen to be together. The nature of this guy being blue in this case is, you might say, a seriously obvious fact. But nobody here needs to mention that the sky is blue. We all know the sky is blue. We can see the sky is blue. It's been blue. The weather in the sky is more important because the sun might get interrupted by storm clouds, and that can ruin all outdoor plants for the day and everybody will be unhappy. Listeners of Night Vale seem to have a major appreciation of the treatment for Carlos and Cecil's relationship. They appreciate and revere it so much, in fact, that they seem to be greatly overlooking how shallow their relationship actually is and how underwritten Carlos comes across. An important character in a story, who is the love interest of the main character, should never ever just be the lover of the main character, who also has one or two defining traits. What are the defining traits of Carlos? He's beautiful, and he's a proud scientist. That's it. That's it, man. That is all there is to Carlos besides being with Cecil. And whether it's male and female relationships, male and male, female and female, non-binary pairings, or any sort of romantic pairings at all, you can't have the partner who isn't the story focused just be a badge on the jacket of the main character. You cannot just delegate them to the role of accessory. They need to have just as much depth, focus, and solid writing whenever they get the spotlight. People love Carlos, but I'm thinking they love him only because he's an accessory to Cecil, and it's a relationship that is treated like nothing else in any form of media. He, and so many others in Night Vale, need to be a hell of a lot more important and relatable than that. This huge, glaring issue of so many characters being just an accessory to Cecil runs rampant throughout Night Vale. Everyone is their most commonly stated or expressed adjective. John Peters, you know, the farmer, is a farmer. The mayor is an insane woman who holds press conferences every day for silly things. The local news reporter has a grudge against bloggers, so she's always trying to kill them. Even old woman Josie, who lives with angels, used to be just old woman Josie, who hangs out with angels, until recently when we actually began exploring who she is. But dear God, was it a long time coming to find out anything about old woman Josie besides living with angels, being on the bowling league with Cecil, and enjoying opera. Even Tamika Flynn, the only character in Night Vale that I genuinely admire, is still just Tamika Flynn, the teenage warrior who leads an armed militia of young people who have had enough of the utter insanity that rules over Night Vale. She's mature, stern, disciplined, brave as all hell, and when she speaks, ah, oh, oh my god, she lets me down. She lets me down for the same reason that every other character whose voice I hear on the program lets me down. I can't get excited about Cecil talking about a new character anymore or mentioning somebody new who gets on the microphone because the performance is always like every other. I have no idea what issue the voice director for Night Vale has, whoever it is, but there seems to be a major, major effort to make sure that every actor, no matter who their character is, delivers their lines in precisely the same tone, the same tone and pacing as every, every other character and they all sound like they share the same vocabulary and manner of speech. I began to notice this during the time that Dana Cardinal, the former radio station intern of Cecil, began calling in from the desert otherworld she ended up entering. Everybody sounds like they sound a little bit like Cecil. There is barely any variation, and it is so boring to listen to. The only character, the only character, who sounds unique is Steve Carlsberg who is often regarded with scorn as being the only normal person in Night Vale. Steve Carlsberg is honestly the only thing keeping me from writing. Death to your pleas. Pray death comes before she brings you to your knees. 
The woman from Italy darkens your door and will stay in your nightmares forevermore. Oh, uh, where was I? Oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I think my train of thought derailed for a second. Hmm. I was on characters. Yes, characters. And Nightfield sure has a lot of them. We only really get to spend a lot of time with Cecil, but I think a good example of what I'm getting at here is, uh... Ah, Steve Carlsberg. Like I said earlier, Nightville has this funny habit of sometimes evolving its weird gags into something much, much bigger. And Steve Carlsberg is one such gag. The most hated man in Night Vale was initially just a name thrown around by the normally affable Cecil who, until that point, only really ragged on Desert Bluffs. And yet here is Cecil groaningly talking about how frustrating this Steve Carlsberg character is. No other details, just one of many recurring foibles in Cecil's repertoire. But Steve has become something more than that as the show has gone on. We learn over time that Steve Carlsberg is Cecil's brother-in-law, a patient family man and, honestly, a pretty nice guy. He works for the Night Vale PTA and is an active member of the community. So why is he so loathed by Cecil and indeed much of the town? It's the fact that Steve, unlike anyone else in Night Vale, sees things for what they are. In a fascinating character study, Steve Carlsberg fully recognizes the absurdity of the town and its conditions. He questions the role of the city council. He points out the members of the vague yet menacing government agencies. The education given to everyone in the town just didn't take with him, so he says. And he can see strange arrows, symbols, and lines in the sky that no one else can, showing him the connection of all things. He is called out on his beliefs and statements by the rest of the town as heretical and forbidden. And yet, Steve shares these facts in a non-confrontational, earnest way. Poor Steve is just trying to help people recognize how ludicrous everything is. I adore this, because as silly and surreal as Night Vale is, it needs a character like Steve Carlsberg. He is a foil, a point of self-awareness in the series that evolved naturally through the show's progression. But he is also lovable, and you feel for him in his plight. The one sane man in an insane world. He is, even more so than Cecil, a voice for the audience. He's just as aware that something is wrong as you are. And did I mention he's played by voice actor and podcaster Hal Lovelin? Say what you want about some of the other voices, only good things, I'm sure. But Hal's performance as Steve really nails the beleaguered Carlsberg and is quite possibly an influence on how the character is written. Hal's best-known work is on the Thrilling Adventure Hour, a live audio drama podcast, so he has the talent to back up the complexities of Steve Steve Carlsberg. Berg. Oh, it's just delightful how this well-rounded... This- Flat as paper, shallow as a petri dish characters are when it comes to Night Vale. Seriously, people like Steve Carlsberg and Tamika Flynn are the only ones who give me hope in listening to the series. Because not only do they express something different from every single nose to the ground, hands over ears person in town, they actually dare to try doing something about all of the issues. Whether it's as small as Steve talking to characters he thinks might be open to hearing the truth, or as big as Tamika Flynn killing a monster that children have been sacrificed to for years. And you know what? Even all the things that people like Steve Carlsberg and Tamika Flynn are against, those weird groups and beings that threaten Night Vale, which are meant to be interesting, genuinely bug me. The vague yet menacing government agency, the secret police, the city council, station management, the mysterious headed figures, the glow cloud. Aren't all of these things essentially the same kind of crooked enemy and the same type of joke? Everyone is spying on the private citizen and prying into their business. Everyone is some kind of monster, whether cosmic horror or human evil. All of them are mysterious, try to hide their intentions while still being extremely obvious, and have complete control and authority over the people they abuse. None of these groups really differ from each other. They all come across in the same way through Cecil. Incompetent in their main function, but extremely efficient in doing their best to undermine your privacy, happiness, and sense of safety and free will. Like the endless running joke about how Night Vale is weird, haha, <laughs> this one about being abused by some subject of a nutjob conspiracy theory performs the same song and dance. It just uses different costumes whenever it comes on stage. How many times in a row can a person sit and hear the same tired, repetitive jokes using the same flat care characters all speaking in similar tones? How many times can we put up with this game of haha, <laughs> quirky, weird mad lips? How? Ah, uh, wait a minute. I think I'm getting some interference. The storm is really starting to open up now outside, getting some weird echo and static on the line. Hold on everyone, I'm going to see how well we're holding up. Let me run a system check real quick here.
I don't know how they keep coming up with such unique plots, but I know I can keep listening forever. Every episode is just so different, so unique, and these characters keep me so entertained, I just... Oh, hold on. Listeners, I think the storm cloud's getting a little angry out there, and our station is picking up errant signals. Let me just take a quick little moment to make sure everything's fine. I'll just... There. Oh, wait. No, no, no. I, I heard another echo. Oh, but no, now I'm not hearing it. Okay, maybe we're good. Hello? Who is this? Oh, wait. What? Uh, hello? Hello? Hi. Yes, it's me. I'm here. Oh, okay. Um... Who are you? Who am I? <laughs> Why, you must not be a listener. That's okay, though. I love new friends. I'm David Dyern. I run a little community radio station from morning to afternoon called Daybrain. And who might you be? <laughs> this is a joke, right? Daybrain? What, did my Patreon members put you up to this? <laughs> oh, no, no. I've been doing this for quite a long time. I actually ought to be asking you who you are. I'm in the middle of a broadcast, and we're having some technical difficulties with a voice coming in and out, and you're the only voice that matches. Ah, uh, well, that's actually the case over here as well. Uh, I'm running a show. I'm broadcasting right now and uh, experiencing a similar situation. Ooh, what's your show about? I'm, uh, Nick Nocturne. I host a show called Nightmind. Ha, <laughs> that's so cute. It's supposed to be creepy and macabre. It's it's pretty serious, not, um, it's not cute. Oh, like a Halloween thing, but all the time? You're dedicated. I have an audience, you know. Oh, me too. I love my audience. They're so fun. Oh, but they might call in or send emails about the intrusion making them unhappy. I'm sorry, but I think I should get back to broadcasting, Mr. Knight. Nice to meet you. Goodbye. Sorry about that, listeners. Now, where was I? I believe it was just speaking about all the intriguing groups and plot lines they take part in for the series. Uh, hey, hey, uh, I'm sorry to jump in like this, but I, I can still hear you. Are you sure that you're on the mic? Did you disconnect from whatever was just hooked up or turned on? Oh, wow. I heard you as if you were right here on mic too in my studio. Yes, I'm live right now. How are you still with me? Not sure, but I've got the same deal. You're right in my headphones, and I'm definitely still broadcasting. I can see all the lights on. I don't, um... I don't see an option to, like, turn you off, either, so... Our wires must have gotten crossed up. I think it's all this crazy glowing storm business we have here. It's been messing with our equipment and must have picked you up, just patched you in. Crazy glowing storm? Wait, what? Like a, like a big dark sort of cloud hanging out in the sky right now? Is that it? Yeah! Do you have one of those, too? Is it all bright and sort of ominous at the same time? Glow Cloud. Why didn't I expect this from the start? Turn the show into one of those episode crossover things, didn't it? Ah, oh, shit. Hey, be careful. The FCC will quite literally give you 40 lashes if they catch you slipping up like that again, sir. Hey, um, uh, hey David, quick. What were you talking about on the air? Why, thanks for asking. I love when people ask about the show. Today we're talking about something you might actually enjoy, Mr. Night Mind. It's my favorite new podcast series, Welcome to Night Vale. <laughs> oh no. Oh, damn it. This is it, huh? This is the Sandstorm episode. We're in the Sandstorm episode right now. That's, that's why we had the glow cloud. Oh my smiling god, you do know Night Vale. I love the Sandstorm episode. I love when Cecil meets new people, even though Kevin was a little bit super creepy, but like a really nice and kind of lovable super creepy, you know? Wow, no, um, not at all. I I'm sorry, man, but I, I can tell already we are not about to find that we're on the same page here. Maybe in the same book, definitely not on the same page. That's unfortunate, and also very sudden. Why do you say that? You were talking about Welcome to Night Vale, right? You said it was, what, your favorite new podcast? Yes, Welcome to Night Vale is ingenious and gives off an array of good feelings for listeners. It's got such a cute premise, original stories, and it's funny in this quirky, offbeat kind of way that I can't help but fall for every time. <laughs> um, well, 
I guess it's nice that you feel that way, but uh, you're wrong. I'm sorry? Your feelings. <laughs> Literally everything you just said. Wrong. You are incorrect, sir. I don't understand. Well, lucky for you, I do. See, there's always a reason behind the artistic expression of the things that I look into, so I understand when weird things occur. And clearly, the reason that you and I got trapped on this radio signal together is so I can defeat my demons and that once and for all, I can shut down overly enthusiastic Night Vale preachers and reform them into thinking, intelligent individuals who don't admire so quirky Tumblr humor over actual effort. I am clearly here for your rehabilitation. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Night Guy, but... but... that's just... rude. There, I said it. I said the R word. I'm sorry, listeners. What makes you think someone who enjoys Night Vale isn't right to feel that way? What makes you think that you're listening to something worthy of praise? Are you being forced into preaching the word of Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner by the secret police? No, I like it, really. I think it has a lot of merit, and it's genuinely wonderful and well-written, and the characters are very unique, and it's always... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he said unique characters. Night Vale has unique characters. Yeah, everybody who jumps on the phone with Cecil talking the same voice and being flat, underdeveloped as hell, and all using the same quirky, oblivious humor. They are so unique. I'll have you know that Night Vale's characters can be very unique and different, actually. Just because it can't always show it through the podcast doesn't mean their writing is empty. Have you even read the novel? Are you aware there is a full novel? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I have a copy sitting on my desk. It makes an excellent coaster for my coffee mug, as it's currently doing, right now. Have you read it at all? Or did you buy it and decide to not even give it a chance? Well, it ended up as my coffee mug coaster so early into my reading that it just kind of, um... Well, it stayed like that. But it's not like I actually have to read this whole thing. I went through the first few pages. It's all the same stupid, repetitive humor and prose I hear from Cecil during every episode of Night Vale. It's like they didn't even try. That's not true. You did not give it a real chance. I know that books are illegal and extremely dangerous in Night Vale, but if you'd open your mind and give it a chance, you might find it's worth breaking the law and risking your life. You're going to tell me that this book, written by the same guys who made Night Vale, which opens precisely like any regular episode in terms of style and writing, is somehow so spectacular that it fixes the problems with the series? Night Vale doesn't have problems. Night Vale is wonderful. Wow. No, Night Vale has huge, massive problems that drag its quality way down. I don't care how big of a fan you are. You cannot lie to me and say that it doesn't have issues. This thing is flawed. I'm... I'm... Well, I'm open to considering that there are issues. I don't think there are very many. But if you have a genuinely convincing argument, I would actually be willing to hear you out. Cecil Palmer certainly listens when others have negative opinions. In that case, I can set my broadcast back to the beginning so you'll be able to hear everything I said. I'll play it right over the mic for you. It's nice to know that I won't have to repeat myself. I will only do it on the condition that you read the novel, though. There's no point in debating if you aren't well informed. I'll hear out everything you have to say, but you really should finish the book. Oh, so you're going to make me suffer to hit the goal then, huh? Alright, I can manage. I can do that. Sure, why not? Have you had a weather break yet? No, not yet. I was actually going to have it a few minutes after I had to stop to check out what went wrong with our equipment. So, I'm right on schedule for it now. Perfect. I haven't had the weather report yet either. We'll turn on the weather, power through our assigned material, and then reconvene. Five minutes is, uh... Five minutes is enough time to finish this novel, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, cool. Alright then, listeners. In that case, I now bring you... The Weather.
So, we're back. I am back. And so is this man, David. Brought to us by giant glowing cloud and possibly one or two satellites. Our, uh, our research is completed. Our brains have been stimulated. And... I think I'm seeing things in a new light. Yeah, exactly. Everything I had been saying is, um, not precisely adequate anymore. Most of it not even accurate anymore, I think. I have feelings and thoughts, and these thoughts and feelings must be exercised. I feel similarly, but I'm still trying to organize my opinions. Why don't you start? I probably should, yeah. I've, um... Listeners... I think I owe you an apology. Welcome to Night Vale is indeed a very silly, very quirky, very weird series. It is filled with characters who cower beneath titans of horror and evil, who are oppressed and abused by the government and groups that have sworn to help them, and are constantly being attacked, annihilated, enslaved, and terrorized. But Night Vale, for all its repetition, all of its time spent beating a dead horse when it comes to running jokes, all of its quirkiness and offbeat humor, is making a point, and is, despite initial appearances, a work of art. Listening to Night Vale makes it tough to see what it's all about. David was absolutely right about that one. If you want to gain a sense of what angle Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner are going for here, the novel is necessary. It still has all the hallmarks of Night Vale writing that annoyed me, but with so much power to play around, use of the space given to them, an opportunity to provide deep analysis on the emotions and thoughts of Night Vale's people, the writers paint a much clearer picture of what their world is and what it means. You even begin to understand why the running joke won't get a chance to disappear for a bit before coming up again. There is, in fact, a reason. Night Vale is a microcosm of the United States. It is a dark, cynical, and sardonic metaphor that shows us ourselves, but it also lets us laugh about it, make a bit of fun to relieve stress, and survive another day. The people of Night Vale are a group that lives with knowledge that they're being ruled by an oppressive, abusive, and corrupt conglomerate of terrible powers. They all have Stockholm Syndrome though. They have become so used to being abused and manipulated, terrorized and tormented, that it has turned into their definition of normal. When the government is evil or neglectful, that's expected. City Council is always out of town for a vacation when everything goes to hell, and when they're in town, we know that despite whatever benevolent things they do to make us think they're alright, Taking just one look inside City Hall lets us know that they are literally cosmic horrors that mean you harm. But everybody knows that, so whatever, we'll survive like we always have. The secret police, who are invading your privacy in the most obvious ways and not being secret at all, are both intrusive dystopian forces and also painfully incompetent when it comes to helping citizens deal with real crimes and issues. Ridiculous, stupid, and overreaching laws you don't know are enforced, procedure is entirely screwed up, and laws that are often spoken about are not enforced even though everybody is aware that a certain action is illegal, like owning a writing utensil or reading a book. The mysterious hooded figures, those creeps whose intentions, code, and purpose are unknown, are an aspect of society that easily represents the powerful and mysterious people who make things happen outside of public knowledge. You can find a more public nuisance that works in a similar way through the vague yet menacing government agency. Nobody knows what they want, and no, they aren't regulated, but just go along with it, okay? They're here for your protection. Sometimes a giant, ominous glow cloud rolls into town, turns people into slaves, and makes itself president of the PTA. No worries about that big, powerful thing that just forced itself on everybody, right? Huh, no, of course not. Can't mean us any harm. The people of Night Vale have come to accept evil in their town as a permanent fixture. It is a normal, terrifying occurrence that they live with. They have been subdued by their oppressors and made to accept them. It is normal for them to have evil around. It's actually best said in a quote by Cecil during the episode Fashion Week about aliens who will be invading in the very near future. Sunday will be the day that Tamika Flynn and the beings who claim to be angels team up to lead a dramatic attack against the occupying force with the help of every Night Vale citizen, driving away our new masters and reinstating our old masters, who are brutal and awful but who, at least, are a brutal and awful that we know and understand. The people of Night Vale are not oblivious to how incredibly messed up their town is. They've just gotten used to it. They have reconciled themselves to living with this. Even Cecil, who should have a better attitude than this, has come to accept that nearly every teenager who interns for him at the radio station will die horribly or disappear forever. Whenever an intern dies, he does express a bit of sadness, 
but never serious remorse. He knows this has happened before, and it's going to continue, but he's above thinking about it. He doesn't concern himself with it. He'd rather focus on Carlos and attending bowling league. That, honestly, is what gave me so much agony over characters when it comes to Night Vale. Even before the novel, I could sense that this town wasn't just making jokes about their situation. They were accepting victims who knew precisely what was going on and that they were submitting. Cecil especially was part of the problem. He is so observant, so informed. He knows that things are not right in town and that the people deserve better. But he doesn't push back or use his voice nearly as much as he ought to. He's willing to help Tamika Flynn, the true hero of Night Vale, who does fight for the people against the evil that surrounds them, but he's not a real fighter himself. Cecil, in my eyes, has always been too accepting of things and acts far too passively. I couldn't imagine what his problem was, or what any of these characters' problem was. But once you pick up the novel and you walk around with these characters, once you begin to look at their setting and know the situation, hear their thoughts, understand their feelings, you find out that they don't know any other way. They were born in the clutches of evil and corrupt systems of government. They have been raised in it, and they will die in it. Well, that's a pretty bleak way to look at things, but I'm glad you see where I'm coming from here. Mind if I interject a moment? Yeah, go right ahead. Thanks a million, buddy. Based on what you just said, this is one of those other points where Night Vale has thrown another interesting narrative curveball at us, and that's the issue of the Angels of Night Vale. Tall, winged beings, all named Erica, who do random odd jobs for old woman Josie, the angels do not legally exist in Night Vale. Everyone knows they're there, and most have seen them, but to acknowledge their existence as angels is apparently a crime in the city. Why? Why does such a dumb law exist? What does the city council stand to gain or lose by this? And why do those people follow the law anyway? Because it's like everything else in Night Vale, and like you said, Nick, it's just the way it is. Fear, paranoia, and silent obedience to absurd asinine laws are the order of the day. I'm pretty sure even they know how stupid the law is, especially considering how helpful the Erikas are, even helping the town fight off and ultimately defeat Strexcorp during the takeover. The public's attitude about angels is understandably benign at best, and if the powers that be in Night Vale have anything to fear from their acknowledgement of angels, it's probably because they see it as a threat to their control. They could represent a positive force for change in Night Vale, which is the worst thing to any sort of being bent on subverting and manipulating opinions to keep the masses in line. But then again, the angels can be just as bumbling and incompetent as those who want to see their name stricken from the town, so it's kind of a moot point, right? That's a very fair observation. Surprised? Only a little. You've read deeper into this than I expected, although I maybe wasn't reading deep enough. I have my small moments. When you think about it, the angels are kind of slowly subverting public perception of things to the point where they've got people like Cecil on their side and now working towards being legally recognized as existing. Call them what you will, but the city council at least begrudgingly is letting this happen, so they're not entirely as evil as some other forces out there, right? I mean, if the people of Nightville are content with their oppression, then those who have tried to seize the town are the worst kind of evil to them. Night Vale is a town that honestly hates change, and its people have been born and bred to feel that way. They greet visitors by pointing at them and growling, Interloper, after all. Night Vale is also a hard city to enter, and even harder to leave. The people don't know much about the world outside of their town, so when something from outside comes in and makes things change, you can bet your bottom dollar that the normally docile populace will rise up and do something about it. Why, look at Strexcorp. I do agree on that point. People in Night Vale may be a serious representation of human beings that simply ignore evil among them and submit to it, but there's also the underlying human flaw of being afraid of change. It's not just that they're under Stockholm Syndrome. They don't want to be warped into accepting or falling under anything else, including Strixcorp, who promised to fix their issues. Strixcorp even recognized the angels, which people knew about but couldn't mention. Wait. Wait, the angels. Yeah, the angels. When am I... God, why didn't it occur to me earlier? The Erikas, who Cecil has begun directly showing support for on the radio recently, who fought against Strexcorp, which was an outsider evil that attempted to choke the town into submission. I... I think I'm seeing pieces fall into place now. When it seemed as if nothing else would save them, the Angels united with Tamika Flynn and her militia, opened up the path for Dana Cardinal and the warriors of the Desert Otherworld to come through, and eliminated the enemy. It's said in that event, during Oak Old Doors Part B, 
that Cecil knows the town is an absolute mess while talking to Kevin, who actually states all the points we've made about how Night Vale is overrun with evil. Cecil is not oblivious. He's aware their town is awful, it is terrible. But it's their town, and they won't let Strex Corp have it, even if the company does promise them reform. At first, it did seem like Strix might have been able to fix things, but they are an outsider. The actions of insiders like Tamika Flynn, her militia, the Angels, Dana, they are all characters who could fix Night Vale's problems, even when half of them are considered enemies or banned from recognition. They really only push out Strix Corp, the invader, but lately... Well, lately in Night Vale, the insiders of the town have begun to recognize that their job doesn't end with keeping outside enemies away. True evil must also be fought from within, even if it's an evil they've come to accept. You have to get involved in the obvious danger you've been ignoring that you always knew was there. You have to be like Tamika Flynn and take a chair from the city council, get into a place where change can actually begin. It's not enough to push out evil corporations or demon puppies or mysterious men wearing tan jackets like we deal with in the novel. In fact, the novel really underlines what the situation with Night Vale actually is, and the way it goes about its story really opened my eyes to what the series is about. Spoilers for the Night Vale novel now, of course. Be sure to submerge your head fully into a bucket of water to avoid hearing secrets beyond your ability to accept them until the time listed on the screen, please, unless you already know the secrets. Seriously, guys, it's that good. Don't ruin it for yourselves. Are you still dry? Good. We can continue. Welcome to Night Vale the Novel presented something to me that none of the podcast episodes ever could. A satisfying, step-by-step -step story of conflict, problem-solving, and resolution. The man in the tan jacket shows up advertising King City with his notes. The characters try to deal with another mystery man who appears everywhere named Troy while attempting to find King City. And when they arrive, they discover a town that has been poisoned by one of Night Vale's problems that got loose. Before Troy, the multiplying man got to King City, it was extremely normal. It was functional. But Troy came from Night Vale. He was one of the broken, weird things from a place where time and reality has been corrupted, and he infected King City, turning it into a bizarre wasteland town that, unlike Night Vale, had no fun or quirky qualities to it at all. It was downright scary, not silly scary, and people were suffering without humor. It was only by taking charge and confronting the issue at hand for the characters, talking to Troy, the multiplying man who infected King City, and also happened to be a runaway ex-boyfriend and deadbeat father to our main characters, that things were taken care of. People who live in Night Vale don't deal with the issues in their own home. The weather happens and things just go back to being the regular horrible normal that they're used to. But in the novel, characters go out of their way to confront something that escaped from the town and also hurt them deeply, and they fix it. Something bad about Night Vale, from Night Vale, was actually confronted and solved. And in the act of solving the problem, we see something kind of incredible that is the real message at play here. Jackie Fierro and Diane tell the man in the tan jacket, the forgotten mayor of King City, that he's partly at fault for allowing the evil that destroyed King City to take it down and make him a forgotten man. He should have fought for the place he loves and is the mayor of. He's only forgotten because he chose to let it happen and kept looking for outside help to fix it, and that help didn't come until he found people directly affected by the Troy situation. King City was saved by Night Vale because it was Night Vale's problem that got loose, but we only find out well after King City was ruined. Right up to the point of solution, the mayor is told that he should have been fighting against an evil that, by all the ways you could look at it beforehand, was an issue with King City itself. True, genuine change happens from within. It does not come from outsider interference. You can always help someone who's been hurt by something that you did because the problem came from you, but outsiders can't solve issues you had before they showed up. Night Vale is trying to teach us this, and because the town of Night Vale is a metaphorical microcosm of the United States, the statement becomes clear at last. Our society is a functional dystopia in a terrifying world. There will always be threats and monsters from the outside, and there have always been threats and monsters inside. We push away and conquer invaders, defeat enemies that try to overtake us in our way of life, but when we get rid of them, we're back to being, as Cecil has said, under the rule of our old masters, who are brutal and awful, but who at least are brutal and awful we know and understand. And like the people of Night Vale, we sit, fully aware of the abuses around us and how we've been controlled, manipulated, and terrorized by domestic evil, 
making jokes at our expense that acknowledge that we're in deep trouble while also letting it roll off our shoulders, making fun of how existence is painful, everything is horrible, death is always coming, and hope is a human construct. But it shouldn't be that way. It can't be that way if we want to be happy. It's not enough to defy the monsters on the outside trying to force their way in. We have to be brave enough to face the ones we've already come to accept as a way of life, acknowledge that they are, in fact, a problem that does need to be dealt with, and they are the enemy who brings us down. And yes, it is painful to change. It is terrifying to break the status quo and shatter Stockholm Syndrome when you've been raised from birth by your abusers, but actual change can only happen from within. King City didn't fight its invader, and it was only saved because people from Night Vale, affected by a problem they had to begin with, chose to finally confront it head on and say enough was enough. The Angels, who saved the town from Strix Corp, who have saved the town several times from something awful and continue to help but have been outlawed, are finally getting the recognition they deserve. Cecil Palmer used to be a problem as a character. He was fully aware of how much power he had and how broken Night Vale was, but he didn't do nearly enough to fix the problems within. Now he's at the point where he's been so personally affected by the love he had for Old Woman Josie and the Angels that he's calling them by name, and he doesn't care that he's breaking the law. He's done putting up with something evil inside of Night Vale that's been there the whole time. Cecil Palmer is finally graduating to the level of Tamika Flynn, the teenager who killed a librarian and has fought for Night Vale's freedom ever since. And Steve Carlsberg! Don't forget Steve Carlsberg! I don't think that he's quite on the same level as Steve Carlsberg, cognizant of the complexities and harsh truths of their reality, but I'll admit that he is getting there. True. Character development continues. And you know what? Night Vale might seem like a lost cause already, considering how in the novel itself on page 193 we read, The tourism board's new brochure said right on the front, A town full of hidden evils and the secretly malevolent. But there are things worth fighting for. In the midst of Welcome to Night Vale's constant depiction of human beings as hopeless, ever-suffering lost souls with no true sense of purpose, identity, or salvation, we do find pockets of reasons to keep fighting. It goes beyond Tamika Flynn. It goes, in fact, to something I was criticizing very heavily at the beginning of this broadcast. Oh yes, I did hear that part. The long and storied burgeoning romance between Cecil and Carlos, begun in the very first episode as nothing more than an instant crush, and its growth over the course of the show until their recent marriage 100 episodes in. Aww. We have seen these two characters go through a lot together. And through it all, they have found comfort and solace in the other, even when separated by time, space, and old oak doors to a desert otherworld. It has pushed Cecil to find answers as much as it has pushed Carlos to do the same. Their success rate is... dubious. But the struggle, as they say, is real. And so is their love and trust in each other. Night Vale may be a cyclical, bizarre loop of recursion, a string of familiar jokes and tropes that draw you in, but at the heart of Night Vale are the small struggles and triumphs, the little details of lives, connections, and relationships that cosmic forces and unnatural cataclysms cannot overshadow. It's the friendship between Cecil and Old Woman Josie, bowling league buddies until her passing, which is mourned by the town and lamented by her angels. It's Cecil warming up, albeit slowly, to Steve Carlsberg and finding some rare common ground with the man who is married to his sister. It's the noble actions of the violet head of Hiram McDaniels, the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home's concern for Chad, the resolve in Dana as she goes from stalwart radio intern to mayor, and her steadfast welcoming of the displaced desert bluffs into Night Vale, defying the norm. It's the camaraderie between Jackie Fierro and Diane Creighton, and Diane's relationship with her son, Josh. This, and so much more, makes up the human element, the punctuating moments of quiet and personal growth under the hodgepodge of insanity that gives Welcome to Night Vale its core concept. Even in the darkest, most outlandish places, amongst insurmountable horrors, hope springs eternal. These, more than any other creepy, kooky nonsense in the show, are those things listeners remember and hold on to, cherishing beyond the initial listening. And it's these things that keep the people of Night Vale going, bringing meaning to their lives, reason to continue, and something to protect. Why worry about the circumstances beyond their control, like the very way their town is run, when your family, friends, and neighbors are all you have? Night Vale is about the community, and you can't spell that without unity. And that's what it really all comes down to. People in a community doing something together to make their world a better place to live. Even through the fear, and the horror, and the ever-present sense of impending demise, there are things that remind humans that, yes, it is painful and scary to exist, and your existence can end at any moment. 
but it does have its good points. A lot of good points. And even though it's terribly frightening to make changes at home when you've grown comfortable with even the most evil of abusers, it's not impossible. King City, as ruined as it was, did come back to life. Cecil, as wayward as I used to believe him to be, has publicly acknowledged angels on multiple occasions and given them courage to fight for their rights to exist in public with City Council. Tamika Flynn has taken the fight directly to the City Council itself, and Dana Cardinal, who has already survived a truly insane adventure, has no problem sitting at a table with a literal five-headed dragon and standing her ground against unreasonable enemies. Night Vale has flaws. It really, really does. And even my cohort for this broadcast would agree, I think. Absolutely. It's not the best series, and the silliness can get repetitive. I don't think there's anything wrong with loving the series for what it is, but to say it's perfect or flawless is a matter of opinion. Even going into this, I knew that, but maybe I just wanted to gush about the things I like, you know? Nothing wrong with that. I just don't think the things that irk you about it irk me nearly as much. I honestly like the run-on jokes and the mimetic nature of the wink-nod humor in the show, but hey, that's an opinion, not a fact. We dive deeper into the material because it is worth doing so. If you can look past the hype and spend entirely too much time picking the show apart behind the surface level presentation, <coughs> you might start to appreciate the artistic endeavor of Night Vale. Right, but in the end, Night Vale is art. It's overhyped as all hell, I mean, dear god is this overhyped, but it's definitely good and it's definitely art. It's very silly, very quirky, abuses its humor too often, takes too long to make me invested in a new story arc, needs to present characters better, very up the voice acting. You might want to stop right there. You could end up in a rant again. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm still going to be a little bit critical of Night Vale. It's not perfect, but wow, it has merit. The jokes that just kept running on and on do have their meaning. Pretty much all of them say something about society or people, and the reactions of those in town say something as well. There's a lot to appreciate about this microcosm of America, and I think that Welcome to Night Vale has a bright, exciting, and certainly engaging future. <sighs> you know, I'm actually glad I covered this. Back when I first began listening, I was convinced I would have been making just a roast review, lambasting this podcast series as hard as I could. But as the episodes grew in number, Night Vale began to win points with me, and when I completed the novel, I saw its heart. The novel was like the cipher key, and everything just clicked after that. Finishing it around the time of Night Vale's current story arc makes everything even more clear. Now, do I forgive everybody who bugged me every month to cover Night Vale? <laughs> no, no I don't. But I do love you, <laughs> my ever-pestering Night Vale-loving viewers who wouldn't shut up about it to save your lives. You guys were right. Like, half right. Maybe like 75% right. It's still overrated, I will maintain that position, but it was totally worth my time. I like Night Vale. I really do. I think Night Vale is good. I think Night Vale is art, and I think that Night Vale is valuable. I'm really glad we got to have this time together, Nick. I learned a little bit more about being critical, and you learned how to piece the layer of a new form of media for your studies. I did. I'm glad we came together somehow, too. My only hope is that anybody who began listening to my broadcast that's like, a Night Vale super fan didn't shut me off and start sending angry messages five minutes into an hour-long broadcast or so. They never would have heard the miraculous turnaround that revealed my final real opinion after the weather. Oh boy, yeah, that would have been really silly of them if they didn't listen all the way through. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty embarrassing, huh? Just jumping the gun and everything based on like one comment or two. But it's not like anybody would actually do that, right? No, probably not. People are smarter than that, I feel. Oh, sorry. That was my Twitter. Ooh, who is it? Uh, it's just my friend Mason. He runs a YouTube channel called Nick's Fears. He says, um... He says big trouble. What? Oh. Oh, oh, oh shit. Oh, be careful of the FCC! Oh, I got a notification too. And it's... A mention about you? What's this about pictures? Wait, what? Wh what do you mean you got a notification about me? Well, that's my intern, Michaela. She's been listening in and doing extensive research on your social media to figure out if you're too problematic to be on the air with me, in which case I'd have to cut the broadcast short. And she says that, yes, you just became a problem. Your Snapchats are... disgusting? My... no, that's, that's, that's not, not impossible. My what? 
Someone named CP Revenge from Nevada on Twitter is leaking your Snapchats, apparently. Looks like they were listening to the broadcast, and boy, are they not happy. Must be your half of the show, CP says. Root cats get put on blast. And yeah, wow, these are filthy. We are not going to be friends after all. I'm sorry, this is very unfortunate. Wait, wait, what? No one was supposed to know. What's their Twitter handle? I need to report this. Give me their Twitter handle. Sorry, Nikki, but you're on your own. I really should go now. This is... I cannot associate myself with you. I apologize. Who is this? Who the hell is CP Revenge? Who the freak do they think they are? I'm gonna find him and tear his head off right as... Fever Dreams is a production of Night Mind Presents. It is written by Nick Nocturne and David King and produced by Nick Nocturne. The voice of Night Mind is Nick Nocturne. The voice of David Dyern is David King. This episode's weather was Delay Today Indefinitely by Abysme. Find out more at abysme.bandcamp.com or on youtube.com slash abysme. Comments? Questions? Leave them below and feel free to check out David's Midnight Marinara podcast at benviewnetwork.com slash midnightmarinara or on YouTube. Links will be in the description. And while you're at it, consider becoming a patron of either or both of these guys. That'd be cool of you. Today's proverb. Pasta is only as creepy as you make it, but roast beef sandwiches always invoke nihilism.